Hello, welcome to the background lecture of lab assignment number 10. Related lectures are lectures 28 through 30, and written materials are in sections 2.8.0 to 2.8.3. Our goals for this lab assignment are to get some idea of the practical application of filters in the context of what is called signal conditioning. Our specific ab application is the measurement of vibration. In general, structural members, things that are supporting other things, beams, bridges, that kind of thing, tend to vibrate when they're subjected to a dynamic load. A dynamic load in this case is t tends to be considered to be something that is applied quickly relative to how quickly the structure can respond. Now these vibrations that result from these dynamic loads can become a significant source of stress and can very easily result in failure of the beam or the bridge or what have you. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster is a very good example of dynamic loads causing a failure. For our particular example, we're going to use a piezoelectric sensor to de detect the deflections of a beam. The piezoelectric material produces a charge when it's deflected. That charge gets converted to a voltage difference between two conductors. We can use that voltage to indicate how much deflection the piezoelectric material is undergoing. Now, the output of a piezoelectric device has extremely low power. You've got a charge difference between two surfaces. You cannot leak that charge off and keep the signal intact. You need to have an amplifier downstream of the piezoelectric device. So the filter we're going to design will be used to amplify certain frequencies in the piezoelectric device's response and attenuate other frequencies. We're going to low pass filter the sensor's output. That will allow us to keep the low frequency information and get rid of some of the higher frequency noise that's associated with the measurement. Now I want to give you just a little bit of background on mechanical vibration because that's what we will be measuring. For my demonstration and in the lab assignment itself, we default to a cantilever beam vibration. If we have a cantilever beam as shown here that is rigidly supported at one end and we deflect the tip and release it, the tip will vibrate back and forth as shown on the slide. Now what is shown on the slide is what is called the fundamental vibrational mode there can be higher order modes of vibration in which the tip is not just going up and down in the same direction as the rest of the beam. The middle of the beam could be going up while the tip is going down, for example. We're just going to be primarily interested in the fundamental vibration mode, which looks as shown on the slide. So most of the energy will be in that mode. So we'll have a good strong signal that we can measure. Now if you don't have a cantilever beam or you don't want to use one, you should be able to do the lab perfectly well by, for example, bonding the piezoelectric sensor to the side of a two liter soda pop bottle. Blowing across the top of the bottle will cause the bottle to vibrate. That vibration should be readily picked up by the piezoelectric sensor. Now let's take a look at the cantilever beam assembly that I'll be using for the purposes of this demonstration. It's the same assembly that I used for the strain gauge experiment, and in fact our strain, strain gauge is still mounted to this beam here, except this time we're going to use a piezoelectric sensor to measure the vibration of the beam, the dynamic response. If I apply some load to this beam and then release it suddenly, I'll get a natural response out of this beam. It will vibrate, the vibrations will eventually die out. So we're going to mount a piezoelectric sensor to this beam, then we'll deflect it, let it go, and we'll measure essentially the strain of the beam as a function of time due to some sudden change in force at the tip of the beam. Now a few words about piezoelectric sensors. Piezoelectric materials produce a charge when they are deflected. For example, old phonograph turntables, the needle was generally connected to a crystal which was a piezoelectric material. Bouncing that needle up and down on the surface of a record deformed the crystal, caused a voltage output which was amplified and sent to speakers as an audio signal. So what you do is sandwich the piezoelectric material between two conductors. Now the charge difference across the surface of the piezoelectric material will induce a voltage difference between the conductors. These devices are often used to sense vibration. Now, one thing I want to point out about these devices, there's very little power associated with the voltage difference between the terminals. Remember, you're applying a charge. If you leak that charge off, you don't have any voltage difference left. So if you deflect these materials and leave them deflected, 
charge will tend to leak from one of the terminals to the other and the output voltage will go to zero even though the device is still deflected. So generally they're used for measuring stuff that is variable with time. The process of this output going to zero eventually for a DC input is called AC coupling. You'll notice that one of the channels on your oscilloscopes, you can choose either AC or DC coupling. The oscilloscope will perform an AC coupling process for you in which the DC values are removed and you can just see the oscillating portion of the signal. This piezoelectric material is a physical implementation of that AC coupling that you'll see on the oscilloscope. This is similar to the piezoelectric sensor that you'll find in your analog parts kit. It has a piezoelectric film inside a plastic coating. There are two conductive elements placed in contact with the piezoelectric film, one on either side. As this is deflected, charge will be placed on one side of the film relative to the other. That will indicate itself as a voltage difference across these pins. Now let's connect up the piezoelectric device to an oscilloscope and look at the response of the device to some vibrational input. You'll notice that I'm not getting any output out of the device since it isn't being deflected, but if I flick it quickly, I'll get a fairly large and temporary voltage output. Now notice that this device is essentially AC coupled. If I put a deflection in and re allow that deflection to remain constant, there will be leakage across the conductors and the voltage output will eventually go to zero. Let me very slowly put a displacement in. See, even though it's displaced, the voltage output goes back to zero. We're getting no DC output out of this. In order to get a good strong output, we have to change the displacement abruptly. Now, as I mentioned, our output signal from the piezoelectric device will need to be amplified. We have very little power coming out of the device. For our signal conditioning unit, we're going to use an active low-pass filter. The choice of an active filter is to keep from requiring power to be delivered by the piezoelectric device. We can apply power directly using the filter to some downstream element. Now, in our design criteria, we have two things that we need to satisfy. The DC gain is supposed to be two, and we want to set the low pass filter to have a cutoff frequency of twice the beam's fundamental frequency. So what you'll need to do is measure the output from the beam, determine a fundamental frequency in that output signal, and then use that frequency to design this filter. Now for this particular filter, R1 and R2 are used to set the DC gain. So for a DC gain of 1, very obviously, if you set R2 equal to R1, you get 2 out of the DC gain. The cutoff frequency is set by R3 and C, so omega sub C is 1 over R3C. You can use the data from your beam's vibration to determine what frequency you want that to be. Choose your resistance and your capacitance appropriately. Now one very important thing, Vn on this circuit is being provided by the piezoelectric sensor you can't pull any current from that piezo device. So R3 has to be very, very high. You want your filter to have an extremely high input impedance. I would recommend something on the order of mega ohms for that. If you can't get a high enough resistance, you could always use a voltage follower coming out of the piezoelectric device. The output of that voltage follower could then go to a low pass filter that would amplify the output and low pass filter it. This slide is a graphical representation of the magnitude response that we want to get out of our filter. The DC gain is R1 plus R2 divided by R1, and the cutoff frequency is 1 over R3C. Notice that my horizontal axis is a logarithmic scale. We've done that in order to stretch out the low frequency range and compress the higher frequency range. That's due to the fact that a difference in frequencies at low frequencies is generally more significant than the same difference in frequencies at high frequencies. I want to emphasize again that the piezoelectric sensor has very little power output. You cannot draw much current from this device and maintain any output voltage whatsoever. 
therefore your signal conditioning unit is going to have to have a very high input impedance. Either use a voltage follower as a first stage, which should have almost infinite impedance, or use a very high value of R sub 3 on the order of mega, mega ohms to tens of mega ohms. Now let's take a look at the implementation of this signal conditioning unit. This is an active circuit, so of course we have an operational amplifier here. I'm providing power to the op amp from this red stripe, which is high voltage, and this blue stripe, which is low voltage. This is my input to the overall filter. Remember that we need a very high input impedance here to keep from starving the piezoelectric device from its power. I'm using a 10 mega ohm resistor, which is probably overkill. This, this resistor and these two capacitors set the time constant of the circuit. Remember that capacitors in parallel add directly, so I use two of this size of capacitor to get to the overall capacitance that I want. My overall DC gain is set by this feedback resistor and this resistor, which is tied directly to ground. Now let's take a look at applying some sinusoidal voltages to this circuit here and measuring the response from this filter itself over here. The output of the filter is going to channel two of the scope. The input to the filter is going to channel one of the oscilloscope. Starting out with a very low frequency input, 10 hertz. The orange line is the input to the filter. The blue line, channel two, is the output from the filter. Notice that at this very low frequency, I'm getting a gain of approximately two. The two signals are about in phase. If I increase the frequency, we should see the output start to get smaller relative to the input. Let me also change my time scale. Okay. Now, my output is actually smaller than my input. I'm getting up above the cutoff frequency of this filter. Notice that we also have a phase difference associated between the output and the input. The output is starting to lag the input by more. Now, you have some experience in lab nine of estimating phase responses and gain. Remember, it's the amplitude of the output divided by the amplitude of the input gives you the gain, and the time difference between the output and the input essentially ratio to the overall period of the signal gives you the phase difference. After you've designed your signal conditioning unit, you need to verify that your design requirements have been met. So you need to double check the DC gain and the cutoff frequency of the filter circuit before you apply the piezoelectric film output to that. So in order to verify that your design requirements are met, apply a low frequency sinusoidal input using the arbitrary waveform generator on your EE board or a function generator that you may have on a bench equipment site. Then you can measure the input and the output of the filter using your oscilloscope, calculate gains and phases for several frequencies as done in lab nine. I would suggest that you measure gain and phase for at least five to eight frequency points so that you can get a pretty good idea of where the corner frequency is. Now, since your horizontal axis is going to be a log scale, which is more convenient to deal with, I would recommend that you separate those points by some multiplicative factor. For example, if you separate them by octaves, you'll be doubling frequency each time. You might go from 50 hertz to 100 hertz to 200 hertz to 400 hertz, so on and so forth. Once you've gotten the data, you can plot the frequency response, compare it with the design requirements, Hopefully your requirements are met and you don't have to go back and do any design modifications. In the very final part, you can integrate the overall system. So you're going to take your piezoelectric sensor output, apply that to the input of the filter, and then measure both the sensor output and the signal conditioning unit output using the oscilloscope. Now one important thing that I want you to do is compare the output of the sensor to the output of the filter, and you should be able to draw some conclusions as to how much amplification is going on at low frequencies. Notice that the high frequency content is being cut out of the filter output, so on and so forth. And now let's look at the implementation of the overall system, including the low pass filter and the piezoelectric sensor. I still have my same low pass filter wired up over here. I've now connected the leads of my piezoelectric sensor, one of them to the input terminal of the filter, the other one is connected to ground of the EE board. 
Now let's take a look at the signal that we're getting out of the low-pass filter and also the signal directly coming out of the piezoelectric sensor. The piezoelectric sensor is on channel 1 and the filter output is on channel 2. Now I've, I'm running the oscilloscope and acquiring data. If I deflect the beam and then release it, I'll get a waveform. I can do that again. The problem is that I am not currently using anything to control where the waveform appears on this screen. What I'm going to do now is use my oscilloscope to acquire a particular frame of data based on some time. The time is based on the triggering time. Let me change this mode to normal. I've now set up a trigger. It is a edge trigger. It is going to trigger on the rising edge of the waveform once that waveform level gets to 200 millivolts. And I'm triggering off of channel 2 at the moment. If I click on single up here, I will acquire one set of data based on where this trigger is exceeded. Now let me flick this cantilever beam again. Now it's acquired my set of data. It will wait there for me for as long as I want it to. Let's take a look at what my filter is doing to this data. Let me change my time base to broaden things out a bit. We can see that the raw data coming out of the piezo sensor, channel 1, the orange line, has a lot of high frequency stuff associated with it, particularly right at the beginning. Okay, we can also see some high frequency stuff here. The low pass filter has amplified the low frequency signal. Notice that the blue line goes to larger extremes than the orange line does. It has also squelched out this noise here. So presumably, if the noise is something that we don't want to see, we can get rid of it with our filter. Now, keep in mind that your filter has to be appropriately designed so that it lets through the information that you want it to let through and doesn't let through other information. Let's go ahead and run this again. Okay, Same kind of idea. There's some noise, some high-frequency stuff here in the sensor output that has disappeared once it's gotten past the filter, but it's keeping most of the low frequency information. We're generally seeing the fundamental mode of vibration of the beam here, but not necessarily any of the higher stuff or any of the noise type signal.